I was preparing some material about Fibonacci sequences for a, um, a class of middle, middle and high schoolers. And uh, looking at some identities, it made me very interested in some inter unexpected connections between Fibonacci um, and trig and complex numbers. So I want to share those observations. Um, they're not original, but I don't see them. I've never seen them actually completely written down. Um, so Fib what's the Fibonacci sequence? So that is the sequence defined by the recursive rule that the next term in the sequence is the current term in the sequence plus the previous term in the sequence. And there's another sequence of numbers that's often mentioned in the same breath for good reasons uh, called the Luca numbers. Um, and they're both actually examples of a more general phenomena called Luca sequences after a French number theorist. Um, Luca, in fact, is the reason why we call this sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, um, and it's pretty much a misnomer, but that's maybe a subject for another talk, um, or you could look up Keith Devlin Fibonacci on, uh, on the internet. So what's the Fibonacci sequence besides the um, recursive rule? You always need a, a starting point, and for a recursive rule like this, a two-term recursion, where the next term you need to know the current and the previous, you've actually got to give two starting values. So historically there's a little bit of disagreement about how to number things, but the modern way to do it is you start with uh, f sub 0 is 0, and f sub 1 is 1. Very natural. If you start with both zeros, you're just going to get all zeros. So this is about the simplest thing you could start with. And then you go from there. So 1 is 0 plus 1, 2 is 1 plus 1, 3 is 1 plus 2, etc. Um, now, um, you can also go backwards. Very often, people only see this part of the Fibonacci or maybe this part of the Fibonacci, but it's very easy to take this recursion relation going backwards. Just solve it for fn minus 1, um, and then this is going to be a 1. You can check that but just by making sure it still goes, goes through forwards. 1 plus 0 is 1, yes. This is a minus 1, so that minus 1 plus 1 equals 0. This is a 2, so that 2 plus minus 1 is 1. And what you notice is that it's nothing new, really. It's just the Fibonacci numbers with an alternating sign. And we're going to explain that alternating sign and make it actually rather prettier, I think, um, later on. Now, the Luca numbers, uh, Luca figured out that there was kind of a nice companion relationship between the Fibonacci sequence and another sequence with exactly the same recursion relation, but with different initial conditions. And uh, you start with F sub, uh, L sub 0 is 2 and L sub 1 is 1, then 2 plus 1 is 3, 1 plus 3 is 4, 3 plus 4 is 7, 3, 4 plus 7 is 11, etc. Uh, similarly, you can go backwards on this one. Um, so minus 1 plus 2, yes, that gives you 1, so that's correct. 3 plus minus 1 is 2, minus 4 plus 3 is minus 1. And what you can see here is that, again, it's the same numbers, again, with alternating signs, but it's a little bit different pattern of alternation. The negatives for the Luca sequences come for the negative, or the odd values of n. For the Fibonacci, they come in the evens. Okay, so this is our starting framework. These recursion relations and this data of the, um, the actual numbers. Now, there's a bunch, there's a huge number of identities about Fibonacci and Luca and how they relate to each other. And I'm not going to, um, to start out, I'm not going to prove these identities. Um, they're very interesting to prove on your own or look up on your own if you want. We will see a proof, a very unusual proof, uh, coming up. But I want to actually just assume that a few identities are known to be true and sh talk about some analogies between these and sine and cosine. So here's one of the fundamental identities, is that f sub n plus n, uh, to look at a Fibonacci number of a sum of two indices, it's uh, 1 half times fm ln plus lm fn. So an interesting combination of f and l together, so this is one of the places where we see that it makes a lot of sense to consider f and l as a pair, they work together very well. But what's intriguing is apart from the 1 half, this looks a heck of a lot like the sum formula for sine. We've got two functions, like here we've got two sequences, sine and cosine are this pair of functions that we're supposed to consider together, and when you look at the sine of the sum of two arguments, it's exactly this kind of combination. Uh, one times the other, the other times the one. Uh, similarly, but it's a little less pretty, f of a difference, again this weird factor one half that we're going to have to explain, and then a minus 1 to the n, which we're definitely going to have to explain, which is really a, a key thing for the whole, the whole um, 
storing an assay. But then the rest of it's fairly similar to sine, cosine, minus, cosine, sine. Um, a corollary, of course, of this one on the top is that F2n, if m equals n, you just, this all collapses down to Fn ln, which is just, this is a really good one. This is a great uh, party trick. Um, if any people know about um, Fibonacci and Luca but don't know some of the identities, this is a very good one. To, it's easy to remember. And notice, again, it's very much like this, but we're missing a factor of 2. So something about this is we're going to have to deal with factors of 2 already. And I'll give you a hint that has to do with the fact that this started with 2, not 1. Um, even though this is a very good way to start it in a lot of ways, this 2 is actually one reason why these 2s are, are not matching up. So um, what about Luca of a sum? Well, it's similar, but now we've got an even weirder thing. We've got a 5 coming in. Okay. Uh, although if you've seen stuff about Fibonacci, you might have a guess as to what that 5 is doing there. Um, but still, it's very intriguing. It's um, LLF plus FF. That's like cosine, cosine, sine, sine. Ah, but the sine is wrong. This is a plus and this is a minus. So something about the signs um, we still need to fix, but we already knew that even up here with the minus 1 at the end. Okay. Uh, so if you set m equals n here, you get a, a double angle formula for L2n. And in fact, one of the uh, things that led me to this is if you look on the Wolfram Math World page, they do talk about these things as double angle formulas, or this is the double angle formula. And that got me thinking, oh, wait a minute. Oh, of course, these are really, these must be related in a deep way to sine and cosine. Um, so you just plug this in, you get 1 half ln squared plus 5 fn squared. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty much of a stretch to say that's analogous to this, but it really is. Um, and then using uh, an identity we'll put down in a second, we can change that, we can do three different ways of expressing that, just like the cosines, oh, that's not cosine squared, that should be cosine 2x, my bad. Cosine 2x, okay. So the, the most fundamental identity, if you're going to convince somebody that there's some analogy to cosine and sine, you've got to look at the Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, okay. And that's a little bit weird. It's not as obvious uh, an analogy, I think, as for these guys. But there is a very important uh, identity. ln squared minus 5fn squared is something that is simple. It doesn't have to do with l or f. It's a 4. Okay, that has to do with the fact that we're getting extra factors of 2 here. And a minus 1 to the n, which we've seen already up here. Okay, so we're going to be able to figure out how to modify L and F in a relatively simple way, and preserve their spirit anyway, um, so that this is going to become a 1. Now, using this identity, it's not that hard to manipulate this guy into a form that only talks about LN squared, and a little 2 times minus 1 to the n, or a form that only talks about FN squared, and again, a 2 minus 1 to the n. Those are analogous to these guys. Okay, again, if you... Um, are suspicious about these identities, the easiest th way to convince yourself that they're probably true is just plug in some numbers. And I'm not going to do that for you. You can definitely do that. It's fun. Just plug in some of the values for um, the initial values, you, positive or try the negatives too. Um, that's good good practice. Um, and you'll see that these really are identities. Or you can try to prove them yourselves for real or uh, look them up. So uh, another thing that's really important about sine and cosine and that kind of distinguishes them from each other is that cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function. And we're seeing a, an echo of that, but a twisted echo of that, that the L sub minus n is minus 1 to the n ooh, times ln. And the F minus n is the same kind of thing, but with an extra minus sign. And so this has an extra minus sign as well. And we're going to see that these really can be analogized to, to these guys, or really interpreted exactly in terms of this. Okay, so what do we need? We need some scaling some twos or fives or something like that to match here, definitely. And we need a way to get rid of these annoying minus one to the n's. There's one here, there's here, there's here, here, here. Lots of minus one to the n's uh, are coming in, okay? Now, what's um, what's the, fr the primary place the minus one to the n comes in? Let's look at this guy. This is really the one we're going to focus on first because it's, it's analogized to the absolute most important identity with cosine and sine. Um, this guy's coming in when you're talking about ln squared and fn squared, and you're getting a minus 1 to the n, not to the 2n. And so that suggests that really 
uh, it's really an I, I want to interpret it as an I to the 2n. Okay, so I'm going to look at the Pythagorean identity here, and we're going to look at this, write this as an I to the minus 2n, actually. It turns out there's a, a bit of a choice of like I versus um, 1 over I here, and it's going to work out a little prettier if I think of this really as an I to the minus 2n, because I to the minus 2, if you work it out, that is really just minus 1. So this is just another way to write this fundamental identity. Okay, so now I'm just going to try to move everything over uh, so that this is 1, and then write that as a modified version of L and a modified version of F interacting in a cosine and sine-like way. Okay, so I to the minus 2n becomes an I to the plus 2n over here, and I divide by 4. Now I'm going to write this all as something squared. So that's going to be an I to the n over 2 ln squared. This is going to be a little more complicated. It's going to have a root 5 in it, okay, uh, times fn squared. But then there's still a minus sign, okay? Now there's one root we could take here. We could analogize things to hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, which does have an identity involving a minus, because it's about hyperbolas. But it's going to be much more familiar if we go all the way to cosine and sine. And it's not going to be any more complicated, really. So um, we're going to just take out one factor of i here. When that's squared, that can kill the minus sign. So that's going to be an i to the n minus 1 root 5 over 2 times fn squared. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to define new, two new sequences. They're not going to be integer sequences anymore. You know, fn, the nice thing about fn and ln is they're integer sequences. Um, the un is not an integer sequence, but it's not a ridiculously weird version. Uh, it's not a huge modification of fn. It's a scaled and, I'm going to say, twisted version of fn. Similarly, vn is going to be a scaled and twisted version of ln. So by a twisting, I mean take some sequence, any sequence you've ever heard of, and then just multiply it by a, basically by a geometric sequence. This is just powers of the same number. And in fact, one way to think of it is twisting is we know that i, when you look at powers of i in the complex plane, you know, here's I'll use my, my uh, scratch pad. If you look at powers of i in the complex plane, it goes 1, i, minus 1, minus i, and then back to here, it goes around in a circle. It doesn't make things bigger or smaller. And if you do that as the sequence is going with different powers, you're going to basically be uh, twisting the sequence. It's a very common thing to do in mathematics, and, and it's often called a twist. Okay, so these are scaled and twisted versions of Fibonacci and Luca, respectively. Um, and what we've accomplished is that those sequences behave exactly the way that sine and cosine should behave. And that suggests, hopefully, we can find a way to identify exactly V sub n as the sine of something and u sub n as the cosine of something. Um, and you might, um, oh, and a, then a tiny other thing, whoops, where are we? Just to stop this video, notice that v sub 0 is still one, is 1, that's one of the 1 half here, okay, and u sub 0 is 0, and that's suggested, that again, is the right values for the starting values for cosine and sine, okay. Now, I'm going to stop this video here and go to a next one. You might want to think, what's kind of crazy, what seems kind of crazy about saying that we really are going to be able to identify this as a, a sine and this as a cosine at this point, given these numbers?